Thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, I'm Martin. Uh, welcome to 3D. Um, yeah, the reason I, I, I decided to do this talk is uh, just that uh, every 3D introduction that you read somehow assumes that you already know quite a lot about 3D. So I'm here to clear a bit of these things up. Um, in the last half year, something I've been doing quite a lot of work uh, that has had to do with uh, 3JS, had to do with WebGL, and so I came to uh, learn this the hard way, and uh, so this is uh, one of the projects I'm currently working on, which is uh, basically just a rendering study to see um, how we can achieve real nice looking effects uh, with uh, very simple polygons and uh, all this post-processing that is required to do that. Um, and yeah, this is uh, one of the studies for the intro for the JSConf Budapest, the first time I'm showing this publicly. Uh, so um, <coughs> the problem with WebGL is basically its learning curve. <laughs> so um, maybe you, you, you read a little bit about what 3D and the web can do, and you're like, hey, we can do this thing in 3D, only to discover that uh, Somehow along this straight wall of learning curve, you just say, uh, no, maybe we find a simpler solution. Um, another problem here is um, every WebGL tutorial ever starts with, hey, let's just draw a triangle, which is basically, OK, so you create a canvas, and you have to set some parameters you don't know about. And we need to create uh, two shaders, the fragment and vertex shader. I'll come to that later. And those shaders. Yeah, well, they have written in a different language, but uh, don't worry uh, too much because we're still not done drawing a triangle. Um, finally, right there with a the vertices array that is defined, th those are the points of the triangle, and it's really this code really just renders a black, a white triangle on a black background. So, yeah, it's. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, there there is a better way to explain this, and I will do this uh, without showing you any code. Uh, so the way that it will work is basically I'm, I'm throwing buzzword after buzzword at you uh, and try to explain what all these words mean in the 3D world. So I did this the hard way, because this is uh, one really, really awesome book, but uh, really, really heavy in math. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, quite worth reading, because it explores all this 3D rendering up to how current generation games do their rendering uh, in greatest detail. So uh, if you really want a deep dive, uh, order this book. <coughs> so um, computer graphics and uh, 3D rendering is a, a, a really vast field. So we have around, around 50 years of research uh, having gone on into this. Um, this uh, yeah, probably one of the best funded areas of research, uh, just the games industry, the visual effects for Hollywood, uh, all those that rely on 3D graphics, uh, poor vast amounts of money into it, so there's no shortage in research. And yeah, finally, it's also a really huge scientific field. Uh, it involves physics, it involves maths, it, it involves uh, Lots of numerics and uh, information technology things. Uh, there are fields like radiometry and uh, all the likes uh, involved. So, um, what is 3D rendering? Um, the basic idea in 3D rendering is uh, that we use a virtual camera uh, to take pictures of a virtual scene. So it's uh, pretty easy like that. To, to, but um, yeah, uh, how, how do we do this? Uh, we need to figure out how, um, how light would behave in our virtual world and uh, finally find out uh, which parts of the light will end up in our camera sensor and form the pixels on screen. So um, a naive solution to this would be uh, we make a simulation of how the photons behave and how they bounce around in a scene and finally figure out which of these photons uh, hit the camera sensor and get displayed. But yeah, as you may know, there are quite many photons to simulate there, so that's not an option. Um, so this um, 
leads to uh, some rendering techniques being developed, um, uh, that, uh, and I will show you the most prominent ones uh, just right now. So the first thing um, is the ray tracing and path tracing. Uh, the idea behind this is um, that you that you uh, just trace how how rays behave uh, in in your light scene. Um, you can see there in the in upper left picture is so basically how, how light normally behaves. So you have a yellow ray that hits an object and gets, uh, gets reflected off that object. So uh, those are the orange rays. And then all these ref reflected rays are reflected themselves. So those are the red rays. And then you, you can see what's happening. And uh, we, can, we can describe each of these uh, paths of light, uh, which you can see in the right-hand picture. So, um, what path tracing now does, uh, that is, uh, it starts backwards. So, uh, you have a camera somewhere in the scene, and, and you cast a ray, ray out of the camera. So, this uh, looks a bit like this. Um, I apologize for the, for the contrast. Uh, not that awesome beamer. Uh, so, we have a camera, and we, we start with red rays, and we, we cast those uh, view rays into the scene and see where it hits an object. So at that point where it hits an object, uh, several things might happen. So uh, we first uh, will draw these lines towards every, uh, every light source in the scene to see uh, is this in shadow or isn't it. And uh, otherwise, uh, which is the case for the, for the right hand uh, point of intersection, uh, there could be an, a reflection, which is a green ray, or it could be refracted through the material. Uh, if it's made of glass or water or something. Uh, so uh, this will be the blue ray. And uh, finally, uh, things can happen like um, subsurface scattering, which is uh, shown on the left-hand side, where, where the light slightly enters the surface, uh, gets bounced around and exits the surface at another point. So um, what ray tracing and path tracing now try to do is uh, calculate backwards uh, towards the light source uh, where the light that shines on that object is coming from. Um, the, po the point of these algorithms is that they are really very accurate. Um, they, can, they can have a, a really amazing quality, uh, in, especially in rendering how, how shadows and lights behave. Um, they support uh, several special behaviors. Uh, the commonly uh, called global illumination, which uh, refers to everything that is illumination that isn't directly from a light source. So in this room, for instance, we only have global illumination because uh, the light sources are basically hidden from us. OK, and uh, yeah, uh, ray tracing or uh, more path tracing are, are used for everything that doesn't need to be in real time. But unfortunately, it's, uh, we are still not there that we can do this in real time just uh, because the amount of computation required is uh, way too big. Um, for instance, Toy Story, uh, they, they took uh, for, for rendering that movie uh, around 2 to 15 hours for every single image in the film, and there were like 140,000 images. So uh, it, it took some time to render that new movie. OK, so here is an example. Uh, of uh, this, is, this is someone actually built a, a real path tracing renderer in WebGL. And uh, looks like we can change the scene here. And, and we can move, move, move around with the camera. And you can see some, some of the effects that uh, uh, only path tracing can do, like these shadows here in between, or uh, these refractions within that glass ball. We can even adjust camera par parameters, uh, like the focal length or the, the aperture size of the camera. So it's, it's a really good simulation of how, how light uh, really behaves. Anyway. Um, <coughs> The main technique that is used for, for uh, real-time rendering, though, is uh, called rasterization. And uh, together with scanline rendering, which is a uh, accompanying technique. Um, so um, basically, all applications uh, like games or everything that does 3D graphics in real-time uh, uses uh, this technique to render. 
Um, so this is basically also GPUs are designed for this rasterization technique. Um, so um, what rasterization basically does is um, we have objects that are described as a huge amount of, of triangles. And each of these triangles is uh, then uh, split up according to which screen pixels are covered by it. And then finally, um, for every pixel, uh, the, the color is provided, uh, uh, is calculated from the data that is available for that triangle. Um, so, um, in order to um, explain more deeply what, what this uh, rasterization does, is uh, we, we need to take a look at uh, some math. So, uh, let's begin with the rendering equation. Uh, this is a funny mix of uh, calculus and linear algebra and uh, trigonometry. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> but no, um, you really don't need to know too much math uh, in order to work with 3D. Um, there are just uh, three, four things that I'm going to show you, uh, that you that you need to be aware of. Um, so first is we have coordinate spaces. Um, uh, a coordinate space is basically just a frame of reference, so it shows uh, for any given vector uh, where, where the origin point is, the vector refers to. And uh, it has three axes, x, y, and z. And uh, yeah, these three axes are uh, organized in a right-handed system. So if you take your right hand, hold it up like this, the thumb is the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. So this is uh, how you always find out uh, which direction which axis is pointing to. So in this case, we have an x-axis pointing, pointing from left to right, y-axis up, like you note, and the z-axis is coming towards you. So um, vertices. Um, this is, you, you probably all know vectors, do you? Math at school? <laughs> All right, so um, vertices is just, uh, or, uh, or vertex, is uh, just uh, the term used in 3D graphics for vectors in, in math. Um, so it's, it's basically just a single point uh, somewhere in a coordinate space. So in this, uh, in this example with a teapot, uh, you can see the, the thin black line uh, which uh, points to the, uh, to the point where, uh, where the one, one, one coordinate is. And uh, yeah, so, Every vertex has the three components of the di uh, in direction of the x, y, and z axis. So what we can do with uh, vertices is now um, we can transform them. You, you probably know from CSS, uh, these uh, CSS transform, uh, this is uh, the same thing. So um, we can rotate them, we can translate them, so move them around, we can scale them. And all of this is done with something called matrix multiplication. Don't worry too much uh, because you have a math library that takes care of this. Um, so it's, it's just um, you have a matrix and you have a vector and you basically throw that vector at the matrix and out comes another vector. <coughs> so um, that matrix is uh, yeah just the recipe about how to make one vector of another vector, and uh, the recipe contains all these rotations, translations, and so on. So um, another thing I need to, I need to uh, talk about are homogeneous uh, coordinates. Um, this is a weird term, um, but uh, you will, if, if you start diving into 3D graphics, uh, you will see four-dimensional coordinates everywhere. So um, don't worry, they similar, they, they similar just uh, describe a point in 3D space. They have an X, Y, and Z coordinate. Uh, and the fourth value is basically just used to enable some mathematic tricks um, that, are, that are required uh, for some calculations you don't need to worry about. So, moving on. <coughs> um, the, 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 the single most important thing in 3D graphics are the geometries. So, a geometry um, is defined using triangles or in, in, some, other, in, in some other systems uh, like DirectX or OpenJL. Uh, we can also use quads, which are rectangles basically, and uh, those are called faces. And all of these faces together, uh, like you can see in the picture, um, form, form the, the surface of the object. Um, 
So all, all of these, uh, all of these uh, triangles are described by three points, uh, three vertices. And all of these vertices um, ha have a common reference point, a common coordinate system. And this coordinate system is called the object space. So the reason for this is uh, that you can move uh, that object space around uh, without having to modify any of the vertices. So the, the shape of the object stays the same, where you can move and rotate and scale it around. So um, from, the, from the geometry, we, we come to objects. So um, an, an object in 3D is just um, a combination of a geometry and uh, a material information. We'll come to that later. Um, so. Um, <coughs> The object is, uh, the, the, the provides, provides the um, coordinate space for the vertices of the geometry and uh, manages all these uh, transforms uh, that, that are used on that object to move it around. <coughs> and finally, yeah, objects uh, are hierarchical, so they can contain more objects. Uh, so if I, uh, I, I can, for instance, just uh, model a robot by I have a body and a child of the body would be the arm. So uh, if I move the body around, the arm moves with it. So the arm uses the body as a reference. And finally, um, there's one uh, root object in, in every scene. So uh, this is uh, also in, in 3JS, it's called the scene. Uh, and I, I heard the term in various other um, systems as well. So yeah, um, the root object hosts the one coordinate space um, that is called the world coordinate space, which is a single point of reference for everything. And it also contains uh, special objects like cameras that, that uh, do the actual filming of your scene and uh, lights that light it up. <coughs> So the, the camera is uh, special in that it uh, actually does the viewing part of uh, filming your scene. So um, it, it can be positioned and rotated uh, like everything else in the scene, but it uh, has something, the, the field of view, uh, which you might know from, from normal cameras, which are, the, those are basically just two angles, like the horizontal and the vertical angle um, that open up that camera view frustrum, like it's called. In addition to this, um, there's al also a near plane and a far plane, which uh, then dis uh, define this uh, cut-off pyramid, uh, which is called the frustrum. So, uh, putting all this together, um, you see on the lower left, for instance, there are several teapots, and uh, the coordinate systems that you can see there uh, within these teapots, those are the object spaces. So. Um, all of these teapots are basically identical. They are just rotated around in a scene. So um, the difference between these three pictures is just uh, what the point of reference is. So um, we, can, we can just uh, view it uh, in any way you want. Like um, if you view the world space, as a point of reference, like in the uh, bottom left, uh, you, you have the camera positioned according to the world space. And uh, finally, there is the view space that is used by the camera. Uh, and uh, so if you use that as a reference, um, you have uh, coordinates uh, of the camera are 0, 0, 0, and everything else is positioned related to the camera. And you can move between these different uh, systems using these matrix multiplications uh, I mentioned earlier. This is why you will find a lot of this matrix stuff uh, everywhere in every 3D implementation. Then there is uh, one interesting thing. How do we do perspective? So um, this is a, a really neat trick. So um, if you see the, the left image, uh, we have that view frustrum and the regular world coordinates. And uh, in order to do, do this perspective, so uh, further away objects uh, are rendered smaller, um, we simply convert this uh, frustrum shape, this pyramid shape, into a square. And this, uh, this square is, uh, is, is called the, um, the clip space or uh, canonical view volume. So all coordinates are converted into, uh, into values between minus one and one. 
So um, as uh, the uh, frustrum defines everything that the camera can see, so does uh, this cube. Uh, and everything that is outside of the value range from minus one to one uh, is simply clipped and will not be visible. <laughs> and on the same, at the same time, you can see that, uh, uh, that this teapot gets uh, distorted uh, according to this perspective. So if we now just watch uh, from left to right into this cube, um, we, will see, uh, we, we will see the perspective uh, transformation taking place. Um, the conversion from the left image to the right image is done by, once again, a matrix multiplication, which is uh, called the perspective transform. So, um, now we have all those parts together, so let's uh, talk about the rendering algorithm. Uh, first, the first step is uh, we need to project all of the vertices into the canonical view volume, so we have uh, them into the in, in this clip space. Um, then we can uh, start to uh, assemble the triangles, rasterize those, those triangles, like I explained earlier, and then finally we can compute the color value for every of the fragments uh, in that image. And uh, yeah, the last step is um, fragment, is uh, the special term for a pixel that is not yet a pixel on screen, but uh, just uh, corresponds to a pixel and is part of one of these rasterized triangles. So um, last step is uh, to blend these color values in case there's any transparency involved. Um, uh, we take the value that's already there and the value we computed uh, and blend them together. So, um, and this is uh, what WebGL basically does. Um, so we have uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of vertex data coming in with uh, the red uh, part, the vertex buffer objects. Um, they are named attributes and they, they run into the vertex shader, uh, which is the first of those two shader programs that you can write. Um, the vertex shader does, does the thing, which is basically just com computes the clip space coordinates. Um, then there are two stages called primitive assembly and rasterization. And finally, the, r the single uh, rastered fragments are passed on to the fragment shader, which will then compute the color. The color blending happens and everything lands in the frame buffer of the graphics card, which is exactly what will be on screen. So the vertex shader um, computes the clip space coordinates and uh, it gets the vertices in um, with, uh, something that's called attributes and uh, gets some additional data, which is called uniforms and uh, it can write uh, output data in form of varying variables which are passed on to the vertex shader. Um, the, uh, the primitive assembly <coughs> uh, now uh, will take these uh, computed vertex values in clip space, uh, assemble the triangles, raster these triangles, and uh, find out where each screen pixel corresponds to uh, some pixel in the triangle. <coughs> and then finally, we can compute the color. So the fragment shader um, can only access data that is passed to it by, by the vertex shader. Uh, doesn't matter too much. Um, and yeah, the, the, the primary uh, uh, responsibility of the fragment shader is to implement the lighting equations and uh, implement texturing for the surfaces involved. So let's talk about materials. Um, in, in the real world, uh, materials, so stuff objects are made of, um, can uh, react to light in three different ways, basically, which is they, they can absorb the light or parts of the light, like uh, only specific parts of the spectrum, which makes uh, this bottle cap here look blue, for instance, because everything but blue color is absorbed. Um, they can reflect light, so light bounces off the surface, and uh, finally there is a uh, possibility that there's a refraction. If the uh, material is transparent, uh, it, it slightly changes the light's direction, which is something you see uh, when, with lenses, uh, glass surfaces, and everything like that. So in the 3D world, uh, materials uh, are basically just what encapsulates all this, uh, all this uh, 
parameters that are required to calculate the color. <coughs> so we have at least one, uh, one material per object, and we can have as many as one uh, material per triangle. Um, so uh, each of the faces of the object can be rendered uh, in a different way with different uh, properties. So there are um, some terms uh, you should have heard, um, which are basically just the Lambert shading and the Blin Fong shading models. So those are the most commonly used and uh, shading models, uh, which is basically just a, a simple equation. Um, not so simple, maybe, uh, but it's just an equation that uh, takes in light sources uh, and material properties like the, the own color of the material or the color of reflected light, uh, and uh, finally it calculates from all these values together um, the final color that you will see if you look at that object from this direction at that point. <coughs> So um, the, the three used models here, there's basic, uh, which is just a plain color independent on, of every light influence. Uh, Lambert shading does, uh, is, a, is a very simple and fast lighting equation um, that can just uh, have uh, diffuse surfaces. And finally, the Fong uh, material, which can properly render also uh, specular highlights, so uh, glossiness uh, and stuff. Um, maybe, uh, so again, the beamer sucks, but um, as you can see here, um, we, have, we have, for instance, uh, from, from back to front here, um, the, the diffuse color amount changes, for instance. So you can see in the back, um, the objects are basically black. Uh, and to the front, they get, they get more and more intense red. Uh, then there is uh, parameters like the roughness of the material, which is a bit hard to see, but um, you can see these specular highlights here, uh, which are caused by the material just not being very rough. And uh, finally, yeah. <coughs> I'm getting a bit stressed. So, um, uh, texture maps. Uh, texture maps is the last point here. Um, and you can see uh, it is basically just a way to paint images onto 3D objects. So these are uh, two simple cubes, and uh, all faces of these cubes uh, have the same, uh, the same picture of a sidewall of a box uh, painted on them. So um, we can use, by using texture maps, uh, we can use uh, these textures uh, and to, to add further detail to, to our objects without needing to specify all of this in, in form of triangles and colors of triangles. Um, so we can simply draw an image onto an object's surface. So this is the most common use case. This is called diffuse mapping. And there are several other use cases possible for like uh, bump mapping or environment mapping, uh, alpha mapping. So alpha mapping would describe how, how transparent an object would be at a specific point of its surface. Um, bump mapping describes tiny details of the object surface. I have an example for this. Uh, environment mapping is uh, something that we need in order to describe reflection because the object needs to know about its environment in order to uh, have something to reflect. So um, <coughs> this is all a bit difficult to put into 30 minutes, I see. Um, finally, uh, one important term here is a UV mapping. The UV mapping is uh, uh, the process of uh, uh, describing how a part of your texture image maps to the geometry. Uh, so a UV map is uh, something that you definitely need uh, in order to put this uh, two-dimensional image onto your three-dimensional geometry. And as promised, here is, uh, this is an example of uh, what, what a very simple material can do if you just add a bump map. So um, as you can see here, um, uh, all, all this detail, all this uh, tiny, tiny specks uh, in, the, in the face, uh, are simply uh, caused by adding a bump map, which 
shows how uh, a bit of a displacement uh, how the uh, how the face uh, is detailed. Uh, yeah. And finally, uh, uh, no time for questions, but um, <coughs> yeah, just uh, find me outside. Thanks for listening. I'm out.